Spirit Connection, invite you to stand to worship our God this morning and sing out to Him. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. So glad you're joining us this morning. Sing out. Don't try to hide you, steal you away. Don't try to keep you inside of the grave. Head of me fought you, he tried, but he loved. We cried for freedom, don't have the walls. Weight of our burdens carried it all. These in our failures. Dead on a cross, you cannot be stopped. So move around, mountain, search, move around mountains, break around chains. Jesus has trials over the grave. Sing hallelujah, battle is won, nothing can stand against our God. on your victory shout out your praise miracle maker mighty to save awesome in power let this in love you cannot be silent There's nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. There is nothing. Sing it again. There's nothing. There's nothing that can stop our God. Stop our God. There's nothing that can stop our God. There is nothing. You're the mover of mountains, breaker of chains. Jesus has triumphed over the grave. Sing hallelujah. Battle is won. Nothing can stand against our continue to worship this morning. We've been introducing this new song, Breakthrough, the last few weeks. Let's lift our voices to God this morning.
true. Shake the mountains. Would you pray with me this morning? God, we thank you for an opportunity to come and be the body of Christ, to be your church. God, we ask that you'd bring your breakthrough, continue to move mountains, to break chains in the lives of those in our community and those right here this morning. God, those watching online that need to see some mountains move in their family, in their job, in their social circles. God, we pray that you continue to be the mighty God that we know you to be. We ask you to bring healing bring peace to our land, to our communities. God, continue to move this morning. Help us to draw near to you in your word. And God, that we would have a shift of thinking, that our worldly thinking would shift to become more like your heart and mind, God. Pursuing things that are righteous and of you. Speak through Mike this morning and open our hearts to your word. We ask these things, God, in Jesus' mighty name and all the people said, amen. Church, you may be seated. It's good to be with you guys here this morning for our fall kickoff. So any football fans in the house? We've got a few of us. Some of you, uh, I'm sure, pretty much sports agnostics, and that's okay. We love you too. And uh, we are excited to kick off another fall of ministry here at Connection Christian Church. And we understand that with this whole COVID pandemic, it has changed life in a lot of different ways. And it's changed the way that Connection uh, does ministry as well. And we have, well, since really about Easter time, went through just a crazy whirlwind of what we do for ministry. So some of you were able to watch us online. Some of you are like, you know what, whenever you meet in person again, we'll be back. And you kind of checked out for a little bit. And so wherever you are across the board, whether you watched online, attended a drive-in service or something like that, you have seen us just try to evolve and adapt and try to find different ways to continue to do ministry. One of the ways that we did that early on was we had scheduled our Easter egg hunt, which many of you know if you've been around here for a while that uh, we were serving uh, a lot, a lot of people. About 1,800 people came through our Easter egg hunt a couple years ago, and we took a substantial step backwards 
so that we could specifically aim at children with special needs and, and really hit a target demographic. And we are so thankful that this year was the year that we did that because it allowed us an opportunity to continue to do that even though we weren't able to gather in a large group. And so we were able to go knock on some doors and deliver some baskets and uh, just have a number of families that were impacted by that. And so that is just one of the many different things. And, and here in a bit, uh, you're going to have an opportunity to go through what we are calling our ministry fair and to learn a little bit more about some of the different ministry opportunities that we have here at Connection. And we have core, four core values around here. Connect, which is what we're doing right now. We're connecting large group gatherings. We grow in small group ministry, and this is a great opportunity right now uh, to sign up for a small group Bible study. We call those grow groups. They're sermon-based. So uh, you might be saying, well, I don't really know the Bible that well. I don't want to look like an idiot. We completely get that. Like, we are all at different levels, and we don't want anybody to feel like that. And so no, no matter where you are in your understanding of God or His Word, you are welcome to participate and uh, there are small group Bible studies for you, and they're kind of sermon-based. So if you check in online or you're gathering here on Sunday, then whatever we discuss uh, throughout the week, it's going to be the same content. It's just really how do we apply it? How does it hit home for us? And then we, we want to be able to love other people with the unconditional love of Christ because we have understood and embraced that for ourselves. And so uh, that's part of this uh, the whole Sandman initiative. The other part... See, uh, you'll have an opportunity to get these bracelets in a bit. Sandman, see a need, meet a need, uh, but also putting action to that love through service. And so we challenge everybody who's a part of a Connection Christian Church to be a part of our church family by serving in the, the church and in the community. Uh, show that you belong and, and you're a part of and you want other people to, to come to know a loving relationship with God. And uh, you want to do that here. Uh, with your church family, but also in the community, because we want to connect other people to Christ. And so if this is your very first time to Connection, we are so glad that you're joining us, and so glad that you can come alongside of us on this journey. How many of you were kind of tired of seeing the rain and the clouds and the doom and the gloom this week? You got a few. And how many of you were so glad that it was super nice yesterday? Yeah, yesterday was just dynamite. Uh, I went around my house a little bit, and we have some different plants, and some of them we put there, some of them were put there by the, the homeowners before us, and some of them were put there by God. And this is one of the, the latter. Uh, this was a plant, it's a tree, and really if you take a look at it, and it was placed in our garden uh, near the house. This is not the place you want to plant a tree. But it seems like if you try to plant a tree and you do it on your own, it's so easy to kill the booger, right? So easy. But if you don't put it there, and it's just an act of nature, an act of God, that sucker is hard to kill. And so if you look at things like this tree, there's a number of different things that you can do. Anybody ever tried to just pull them out? Yep. And so sometimes that works, sometimes not so much, right? You grab a hold of it, and it is anchored deep. And sometimes you just rip it in half. Sometimes you just go over and you, you cut it because you can't get to it, so you just you snip it off. Some of us, we go the chemical route, and we, we try to dig in. But if you really want to take out a tree, what is it that you need to do? Uh, any kind of nuisance plant, what do you do? You have to get the roots. And so if I were to pull this thing apart, I'm going to make a mess on this stage. <gasps> You're going to see that there is a whole lot more to this tree than what it first appears. And the bigger they are, the bigger the root structure. Right? This is why sometimes we have plumbing issues in our houses, because we have trees in our yard. And the roots don't always like to stay where they're supposed to be. So this creates a challenge, and this is what we're going to be talking about today. Whenever we get together, we try to remember about 9.30 to to huddle up and have a prayer time uh, with our team. And I told my team this morning, you know, hey, this is it's kind of a different service. We're going to go three songs instead of four. We're going to go a shorter message. And they just laughed at me. <laughs> and they're like, you know, we'll just flag you down in the back. We'll just, you know, have her cut off your sound in the back. And, and you'll know. And it's like, then I'll just assume my batteries are dead and keep talking anyway. So here goes nothing, right? Here goes nothing. 
we've been in a series called Shift. Shift is about changing our mindset, changing our attitudes and our actions based upon new information that's coming our way. So in week one, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And for many of us, this is not new information. But for some of us who have just been indoctrinated by the world that we live in, it flies in the face of evolution. And this can be a hard thing to grasp. And we try to find a way to kind of maybe make the two meet in the middle. And maybe I want to meet you in the middle a little bit here and and think, if God is powerful enough to create the heavens and the earth out of nothing, he was formless and empty, and God is able to, through Jesus, redeem what was broken and bring it back to life, is it possible that God could create the heavens and the earth at an older age? I think it's possible. And so if you think that you need to go back and kind of find some, some anchor, like how do, we, how do we make this meet? But I would definitely say that, that if you believe that God created the heavens and the earth and it changes some things, it changes perspective, it means that instead of a random act of coincidences have brought you to this place, that God by choice, by his design, has created you, which means you have a purpose and an identity in him. And we talked about that identity in week two, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, that, that he said, in our image, let's create him. Male and female, we will create him, right? So God is in, in existence in a plurality, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we too are designed to work and to live in community with one another. And when God set into motion this idea of creating man and woman, he, he created a design, he created a pattern, he created created a formula, and he created something that, that isn't just in existence in Adam and Eve, but something that is designed to repeat over and over again and give us all of the variety of different people that we see today. God, in his amazing, infinite wisdom, was able to create all of this in that moment on day six. But we're created for his purpose, in his image. We're the only thing out of all creation. It was designed that way. And last week, if you were with us at the drive-in service, we talked about uh, Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, and we talked about uh, being drawn out of the land. I am the God who brought you up out of Egypt, right? And this is, this is to set us apart. The, the topic was holiness, right? You and I, created in God's image, we are designed for a purpose. That means to be set apart. We have a special use and we're holy. But you and I, based upon our own sin nature, we've, we've kind of tarnished that holiness through sin. And it separated us from God. And it's so easy to think because of all of that, I am useless. I am good for nothing. But God isn't done with us yet. And in his design, back in Genesis, we see that God created a way out. Jesus was was thought of long before you and I were ever born. The Father, the Son, the Son that died for us, the Son that redeemed us, and you and I, even when we're lost and dead in our sins, God loved us, and we're still holy. We just need to be cleaned up. (laughs) And Jesus has got the cleanser to top all cleansers. And so quit thinking that you're not good enough, that you've already messed it up, that there's no possible hope for you because in Jesus, there's hope for everyone. You see, all of this stuff is so very foundational to Christianity, but it's such a hard thing to really understand for our lives. But when we can begin to understand some of these building blocks, it opens up our minds to new ideas and new possibilities that I'm not worthless, I'm not a screw-up, I'm not a mistake, right? That God has a plan and a purpose for me, and and it allows us to think differently. And today we're going to talk about that from the idea of what lies beneath. Uh, There's a passage of Scripture, it's found in Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, and if you're following along in Core 52, which is something we've been doing all year Uh, Core 52 is uh, 52 core verses from the Bible that kind of help give us a good understanding of Scripture. 
Matthew chapter 25 in verse 41. Jesus is speaking here, and he's doing this parable of the sheep and the goats. So the basic premise of the sheep and the goats is the goats are bad, the sheep are good, don't be a goat, right? The goats, they, they know what they should be doing and they don't do it. The sheep, they see what needs to be done and they do it. But following that, in verse 41, we, we hear these words. Depart from me, you, cursed into eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, this is speaking of the goats, those who are evil in the eyes of God. Now, the premise is this, that Jesus, in one verse, in one statement, has confirmed the existence of angels, demons, and hell. So if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe that He has come and He's died for your sins, then you need to understand that among His teachings are these teachings of the supernatural. You and I, we exist in the natural world. We, we have our senses. We're, we're taught to observe things with our senses. And throughout this series, we've, we've tried to tie in a little bit of science with it. And science is based so much through observation, right? The things that we can we can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can smell, we can touch. You can't do that with the supernatural. But if you and I are created in the image of God, one of the things that that makes us is supernatural. You and I, even though we exist in the natural, there is, as they say in an old cartoon I love, there's more than meets the eye. Right? It's not always about what you see above, but what's dwelling below or around us. Right In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So we're a part of this journey. And guess what? It radically changes the way you live life when you begin to realize that there's more to life than what I see, what I can touch, what I can taste, what I can smell. Right, That you and I were created not for 120 years here on this earth. That's what it says the, the years of man shall be. And, and it's up to that point. But you and I were actually created to live eternally. When we go back to the book of Genesis, we see that there is this idea right, that God has placed Adam and Eve in the garden with the tree of life. And they can eat from the tree of life and they're supposed to have an eternal life. But when sin entered in, brokenness entered in, we separated ourselves from God and from eternal life. But through Jesus, that's made right again. You and I, not in this flesh and blood, but you and I in spirit are designed to live forever. And so that makes these momentary lapses, the things that you and I find pleasurable for a moment, it kind of makes them a lot more insignificant. You see, it's like that play in a football game that you look at it, and you, you see it, you think you've got the right play called up, and you realize that the defense has just lined up in exactly the defense you don't want to see. And it's like they have been in your huddle. And the quarterback drops back, and it seems like the linebacker dropped back at the same time, and boom, and you're thinking, oh, it's over, we're hosed then you realize that's just one play in the game, right? Because there's so much more to life. And so all of the things, right, all of the things that you and I get hung up on, the things that we think that we have to have in our life, that my life isn't going to be good unless I have A, B, and C. And now there are many different people in this room, and there are many different A, B, and Cs. Like, I get that, right? Because some of us, we battle with materialism. But when we have an eye on eternity, the materials of this world will fade away. Right? Some of us, we, we have a, an appetite for a thrill, for a pleasure. We're, we are a junkie when it comes to adrenaline. And we realize that all of those highs can't be matched in eternity. Right? Because we are designed for eternity. And so when we compare the two, nothing. When we endure pain, because all of us, at one point in time, we endure pain. The pain that we deal with now 
when we put it on a platform that involves eternity, it's completely different. Right? We have a different perspective in life. So a few things here about uh, angels and demons and heaven and hell uh, that I want to draw your attention to because we're not spending a ton of time here. It's just laying that foundation that even Jesus believed in all this stuff. So you and I need to jump on board. It was a couple uh, months ago we did a drive-in service and the topic was heaven. And so if you want to learn a little bit more about heaven, that's a good place to start. Just go into our YouTube channel. If you're watching online, I think we're going to be posting a link there uh, to that sermon, and you can just go there and click on it and get some information. But uh, in general speaking, a lot of us think you know, that heaven is some far-off place right? That, that we're eventually going to go to. But in Revelation 21, it talks about there's a new heaven and a new earth coming down. And God who resurrects the dead, the, you and I, he, he covers the sin and gives us new life. He's resurrecting this entire world. And the premise of heaven really is that God is making all of this new again. And it kind of creates a shift. Hell, right? Most of the things that we believe about hell aren't even from the Bible. They're from cartoons and movies and Dante's Inferno, right? They're not even founded in Scripture. Hell really is the absence of being with God. And, and, and it's not that God is necessarily punishing. He's God is allowing us to have exactly what we want, which is nothing to do with Him. And that's a scary place to be. Because He is the source of life and of love, right? Of all things good. And then angels and demons. It was about two years ago for uh, Halloween, we did a series called Supernatural. And we talked about some of the different things, uh, witches and uh, evil spirits and demon possession and things like that. And, and I would encourage you to go back and, and take a look at that series too. Again, it's just called Supernatural and get some understanding. But, but really, like the angels, they're created to be ministering spirits. They're actually here to protect you and I to guide us, right, to encourage us. They're messengers from God. But some of those angels had an opportunity, like they all have an opportunity of free will, and they chose to rebel against God. And so they, they went with Satan, who was also an angel, and that's what we know as demons. So they're all angels, the good and the bad. And that's a nutshell of what we're talking about, and I, I think that there is a, a passage that kind of uh, brings this to life for me, and it's in the Old Testament. And it's in Second uh, Kings chapter six. Second Kings chapter six. So it's a big fight going on. Elisha, one of the prophets of God, he's there with his servant, and all of the the enemy forces are surrounding the city where they're encamped at. And Elisha's servant is like, oh, stink. <laughs> this isn't good. And Elisha prays in verse 16. He says, do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, by human eyes, by looking at the natural, his servant would have been like, what are you smoking, buddy? <laughs> that is not reality. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So that the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around Elisha. In the natural, they were hosed. In the natural, they didn't stand a chance. But in the supernatural, they were stacked. They were locked and loaded. Guys, when you and I call on the name of God, we call upon his army of angels. And there is a supernatural force that is with us. And if, if God is with us, what's it say in Romans? Who can be against us? Right? But so many times, so many times we look at the natural problems in life and we try to conquer them with natural solutions. Right? We work harder, thinking if I just work harder, I'll fix this. We stress about it. 
We, we worry so much. And we don't ever attack the roots. And it's so easy as natural beings in this natural world to not see the supernatural that's lying beneath us. The things that we need to address. So is it possible that the struggles that you're having in your marriage right now are not natural problems, but rather supernatural problems? Is it a possibility that the struggles you're going through with your health and your finances right now are not natural problems, but supernatural problems? Jesus unpacks that a lot in Matthew chapter 5 when he he really gets down to the root of the problem. He says, you've heard it said, but I tell you. And he's, he's saying, all of this superficial stuff Quit trying to not do the superficial stuff and worry about the root cause. And so there's a lot of root causes in our life. But one of the things that we really need to do is to just dig down deep. I'm going to take this analogy a different direction. Uh, so last year, we dealt with a huge flood in our area. And many of you were a part of that journey. We set up a, a flood relief distribution center. And I am still working with Church in Action to distribute funds. To this point, we've distributed about $20,000 to families who are in need, and we had to wait so long because we're a part of what's called an unmet needs table, which basically means this, that all of those people, like we wanted to send them through the natural channels as much as possible first so that they could get the funding that's out there, and then the funding that's not available, that's where we come in at. And so it took us a solid year to even be able to get to a point where we could start writing checks, right? And so over $20,000, I say that because there's three projects that we're just getting ready to sign off on that will uh, probably bump that up another $20,000 uh, that's going into flood relief. But I learned something along the way, a lot of things really. One of the things is that there were a lot of people that came through the distribution center and out of that, a lot of people that came in, especially early on, most of them did not need help with flood relief. They just wanted some stuff. But the heartbreaking part was not that they came in. It was that the people who needed help didn't come in. And let me tell you what I believe is one of the root causes. Pride. We call it Nebraska strong, but really it's Nebraska pride. Human pride. And if we're going to be honest, it lurks inside of each of us. It's really hard to ask for help when we really need it, especially when we're afraid it's going to make us look like an idiot. Right? If it makes us look weak or insecure, it's so easy for us just to deal with the surface level problems instead of dealing with the root causes underneath. Another thing is that a lot of people... They were inconvenienced by the flood. Anybody here inconvenienced by the flood? Some of us more than others, right? Uh, some of us, like we were stuck on the island known as Columbus because there were no roads going in and out, right? And so you had to worry about what supplies are going to be at the store or not at the store. Or maybe you worked on the other side of the river and you couldn't get into your job or you had to drive a couple hours out of your way to get to where you needed to be. Right? And some people lost lives and some people lost homes and lost farmsteads and there's lots of things. Right? And so they wanted to get things back on track as soon as possible. All of us. COVID, right? Week one, we're like, I'm done with this. Right? I'm done with it. That's how we live our life. And so people would, would go into their own homes instead of asking for help and they would strip out all the drywall and all the carpet and everything and they would expose themselves to horrible things inside of their homes like mold and mildew, in an effort to get that stuff out of there. And they would risk their health not for that moment, but for years down the road. Guys, we have not even dealt with the consequences of the flood yet. Right? They're going to be years down the road. We have people two years from the flood who are still living in their homes without insulation, with open studs, with mold inside of the walls. We have some people that went back and, you know, they didn't air it out because they were in a hurry to get back to normal. And so they, they just covered everything with bleach. And I learned that bleach does a good job of killing the mold on the surface. But it does a horrible job of penetrating. And so they make some special stuff, right, to penetrate in 
to get rid of that mold so that whenever you dry it out and seal it up, it doesn't come back. But if you just deal with it on the surface, guess what? It co- it's going to come back. Right? And the things that are lurking inside your walls are unseen and they bring death and they bring illness. And I really want to tell you guys, there's way more than meets the eye. There's a lot more underneath. Right? And you and I, we have a choice. We can, we can ignore it. We can pretend like it doesn't exist or we can use it to our advantage. And I think that as believers in the one true God, It's about time we use it to our advantage. Jesus is dealing with another situation in Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, uh, the disciples are sent out to do some healing, and and, uh, most of the time this works for them, but they run into a situation where they're not able to heal this boy. And so uh, when they can't do it, they call in Mr. Big Guns. And so Jesus comes in on the scene And he does the healing kind of after he gives them a little uh, lecture, like, oh, guys, you and your little faith, like, what are you doing? And so he does the healing. The boy is healed. The disciples are like, oh, how'd you do that? And the simple solution to this is, Jesus says, these kind can only be driven out by prayer. They can only be driven out by prayer. You see that thing that you see, the thing that's causing problems on the surface? There is a supernatural solution to dig down to the roots to address this. And you guys simply aren't digging deep enough. Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And it's about this spiritual armor of God. And I would encourage you to dig a little deeper into this passage, Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, and it's talking about a supernatural battle and the supernatural spiritual armor of God. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of even evil in the heavenly places. Guys, we live in a world that is so at each other's throats, right? In our marriages, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our society, so much. And if we can understand that we live not for the natural, but with the supernatural, that there are roots that dig deeper than the division that's lying on the surface, then we can begin to realize that the only hope for a world who's desperately in need of a solution is a spiritual one. It's not going to be solved with politics. It's not going to be solved with a vaccine. It's not going to be solved with a government handout. Right? It's only going to be solved with Jesus. And so when we look into this armor, we see that the belt of truth is the first thing mentioned. Jesus is referred to as the truth. So when we talk about the belt of truth, we're talking about the word of God, the written word of God. And it's an anchor, it's a foundational piece to the armor. And you may see that the Bible is just a natural source. And you may see it as something, oh man, I don't want to read, I don't quite get it. But I want you to tell tell you this is spiritual food, right? This is a spiritual source, and you are spiritual beings. You were created in the image of God. You were created to be holy. This is going to tell you how to align your life with God and to pursue His holiness. And so when we don't put on the belt of truth, we have no anchor to our armor. Everything else is for naught. The thing about a belt is if you don't have it, sometimes you get caught with your pants down. Right? One of the last pieces that we're told about is the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit, the spoken Word of God. It's put into action. You see, it's not just enough to to read it, but we have to live it. We have to apply it. We have to share it. And that's when we begin to take the offensive attack. I want to share with you not just the Word of God, 
but something that comes right after that. And it says in verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. It's all of this spiritual armor. It's founded in the Word of God, and it's founded in prayer with God. Elisha unleashed the spiritual army through prayer. Right? You and I have an opportunity, right? It's to fix it ourselves, which doesn't usually work, right? It's to stress about it, fear about it, fret about it, tell somebody else about it, gossip about it, right? Or we can pray about it. A couple of years ago, I was going through a, a difficult time in ministry and personally, and uh, I had an opportunity to speak at the, the Christian school here in town. And the, the topic was assigned to me. I didn't go choose it. And it was like it just smacked me like a two-by-four in the head. And if I'm going to be real, I need that two-by-four a lot. Because I'm thick-headed. Because in pride, I try to fix things myself. In pride, I think that I can do it. God has gifted me with a lot of great abilities, and yet one of the problems is that oftentimes I pursue independence rather than dependence upon God. But we started this initiative we call Pray First. And if we're going to be a church that is going to powerfully move on behalf of God, we have to pray first. right? If we're going to have marriages that represent Christ to the community around us, to the rest of our families, we need to pray first. If we're going to impact our families, our children and our grandchildren for years to come, not for this time, but for the time yet to come, it's because we pray first. If we're going to change the impact and the flow that we have in our jobs and in our schools, it's because we pray first, right? It's not because we go deal with natural things with natural solutions. It's because we realize there's a supernatural root and we want to dig deep. And so many times, guys, hear me out. So many times we encounter problems and we simply want to pray them away as if we're taking a pill as an immediate fix. Well, I prayed about it. No. What you did is you rubbed the magical genie and you're hoping that God shows up and that he fixes your problem and you can have an easy fix. When sometimes what you really need to do is dig in so that you can dig to the root. I don't know where I'm at on time, but I hope you got something out of it. Right, I hope you realize that there's way more than meets the eye. And that we have a God who has designed us to be holy. And I've given you a couple tools. He's really given you a couple tools. The question is, will you use them? Will you use them? Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to see something deeper, something more meaningful, something that goes way beyond the natural. Help us to be a church Help us to be marriages, to be families, to be business owners and employees and and teachers and administrators and students who pray first. Father, help us to understand that to truly be holy as you've called us to be holy, it means that we have to get into your holy word. That we we would learn it, we would live it, we would teach it. Father, guide us, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this week was 19 years since 9-11. And if I'm being honest, when I woke up that morning, I didn't remember. I made it about halfway through the student walked up to me and asked if I was alive because one day I told them that they used to roll in the TVs into our classroom they were mounted on the walls now they just think I'm ancient so they'd like to ask me if I was alive during these crazy times so he asked me if I was alive and I said yes I was and he said well my dad remembers what he was doing does he remember what you were doing and I was in the first grade so I told him that and he said that his dad talked to him about 9-11 a little bit what it meant to our country and how it changed things and then he continued to talk and it really shook me what he had to say he goes I wasn't born yet I wasn't alive but 
I think I can remember forever what 9-11 means to our country and how it changed things. My dad said it changed a lot, like airports. And this really hit me hard. If he can remember that, he wasn't alive. How can we remember what Christ did for us even though we weren't alive? We read about it. Are we living it? Are we remembering it? So as you take communion today, I want you to think, do we remember when we do communion? Do we truly appreciate and think how Jesus' pain and suffering changed things? We are to remember his pain and suffering and how he changed things. And in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So as you go throughout your week, I challenge you to think about how you remember this in your daily life and how you live it. I read a story that really captured my mind. It was about when they were on the ground when this happened and a priest was there and some firefighters came up to him and asked him if they could take communion. And the priest admitted like, you wanna take communion? We're like in literal hell right now. Why do you wanna take communion? And as he was writing this letter, he said that these firefighters wanted to remember what God had given them, that God, that Jesus gave his body and these people gave their bodies in this horrible time that they needed to remember that while they were digging for their brothers and sisters. So as we continue throughout this week and as you take communion, I strongly urge you to really think about in your actions and in your ways, how are you remembering God and the sacrifice he gave us? And are you sharing that with others? So let's play really quickly. Father God, I pray that as we walk throughout our week, that we continue to remember what Jesus did for us and when he broke the bread and drank the wine, that we really think about the sacrifice and are we living that in our daily lives. Please be with us as we continue with our daily struggles and that we turn to you instead of to our sinful nature. In Jesus' name, amen. To come to this time, I want to say a couple words about our offering here at Connection. If you're visiting with us today, by all means, do not feel obligated to give. But in the meantime, giving back to God is an act of worship. So this is an extension of how we worship God, that in His Word, in the truth, that we trust Him with what He's given us. As good stewards, we give back a portion of what God has already given us, of what, what really is God's in the first place. And just like, in a way, sometimes we need to dig deep to get to the root of the problem, we need to sometimes dig deep just to give. And I'm not saying dig deep in your wallet to give more. I'm saying just to dig deep to maybe even start. That we need to dig deep in our faith and our trust in God to be able to give that to Him. Because times and money, finances, budgeting, it, it can be tough. But in the meantime, if we're not managing all of what God has given us well, God watches that as a steward. And he's going to reward us for trusting him with what he's given us. It's not prosperity gospel. It's obedience. It's, it's honoring God and worshiping him and, and trusting him with that portion. And so maybe today, in an effort to just start somewhere, to give. Not even, I'm not saying full-blown 10% tithe or anything above that. But just to start. You might need to dig deep and trust God. Say, so, okay, this 20 bucks is going to go to you, God. We're going to start there. We're going to see how God continues to provide and give. Because as we talked about flood issues, as we talked about people in need, <clears throat> those are things that help us meet needs in this community. 
And we have that budget, we have those resources to continue to reach out in our community and meet needs as the body of, of Christ. Church, we're going to stand up. We're going to sing a song together before we get to our ministry fair time. We have a victory in Jesus. We have this great victory in the death that Jesus died and his resurrection. We have this awesome, awesome victory. And while Satan continues to try to get the best of us, we lean on God's word and his truth. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. God, I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, we won't. My God will never fail. Sing it, church. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Church, you may be seated. These are going to work here. Uh, so we would really encourage you, number one, if you brought children with you today, to actually let them hang out in the kids' area for a while. Can I get an amen on that? Woohoo! Right? But that is so that you can kind of make your way around the ministry fair. And as you're making your way around the ministry fair, I want to encourage you to go back by the hospitality table, grab a cup of coffee or a glass of water, and they've actually got some cookies back there for you as well. They're individually wrapped, so uh, feel free to take those as you wish. And there are some gluten-free options back there as well. So 
Um, those are uh, a few of the things that we want you guys to do um, in response to today's message. If you're ready to, to suit up for Team Jesus, the most important team that any of us could cheer for today, right? Then I'm going to be around and I would love to visit with you more about that. If you would like to turn to God in the Pray First movement, we have got a table set up in the center uh, on the side of the room here where you can write down your praises and prayer requests and clip them to the prayer wall. And we want to encourage you to do that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of different booths with a lot of information. Many of that, uh, those booths are going to be over to the side, but worship is going to be up on stage. So if you're thinking, you know what, hey, I'd like to help out with worship, you could actually come up and like uh, play on the equipment here a little bit. And if you can't play, well, we'll know that pretty quick. And we'll say, you know what, maybe you should go help someplace else. <laughs> right? Um, but that is an area. Uh, the tech booth in the back, those guys are going to hang out back there. So if you have questions like, so I hear you've been saying you, you need some help in the tech. What exactly does it involve? Right? This is a great opportunity for you to ask questions, uh, to be able to actually use some of the equipment uh, if you'd like to. Uh, hospitality, of course, they're going to hang out in the hospitality area. And so you can learn about that. And so we would just really encourage you guys to find a place, if, if you call Connection your home, to find a place where you can plug in, where you can serve, and where you, where you can participate. You, at, while you're at Connections, you can also sign up for a grow group, the sermon-based small groups. And next week we have pizza with the pastors, which is a great uh, entry level. If you're new to Connection and you've not been to pizza with the pastors, we lay a little bit of our foundation. We answer questions that you have, at least the ones that we think we can. And uh, we get to know you a little bit better. And so I'd encourage you to participate with that as well. And you can sign up at Connections as well. So that's kind of what we've got going on. And we would love to have you guys stick around. I understand that some of you are going to rush off because you have a game that you're going to watch. I'm going to save you, right? If you will go to NFL Game Pass, you can get a seven-day free trial. And you can watch your team anytime you want over the next seven days. And... You can do it in 40 minutes without all the commercials, right? I am not a spokesman for the NFL, but if they want to pay me, I will gladly receive it. But there you go. Thanks so much, for guys, for being Connection Christian Church, for helping us connect the Columbus area to Christ. We're so glad to have you. Oh, yeah, that's a good thing to announce. Uh, so when we're done here, we're going to go to Pawnee East, which means that if you're directionally challenged, if you're looking... Uh, towards the viaduct from, from here, then it's going to be on the left side of the road. So, yep, think Ramada side. Uh, we're doing a bring your own picnic. Here's the good news about that, too. You don't have to eat somebody's cooking if you don't like it, right? Number two is if you forgot all about it and you didn't make anything, you can swing through anywhere you want and grab something, right? And you just bring it, cool? Like drive through, pick it up, smooth sailing. And then you can hang around for activities. So there's disc golf, basketball, skateboarding. I know all of you are dying to get out there and hit the skate ramp. Uh, but lots of different things that we can do out there. And the main thing is just to kind of hang out and get to know each other a little bit better. So thank you guys for being Connection. And uh, have a great day if I don't get the chance to talk to you a little bit later. So this is your chance now. We don't have any more music, no more anything else. Just get up, mix and mingle, grab a cookie, grab some coffee.